yeah, we can go ahead and get started. We have a quorum. So uh, thank you and welcome. Uh, before I turn it over to Chairman Bennett this morning, I just wanna remind folks that the restrooms are out that door to the left-hand side. Again, a reminder about the microphones. I apologize if I interrupt you while you're speaking. If you are in the room, uh, you need to turn on your microphone for the folks online to be able to hear you. Um, so just press the button and turn it off when you're done. But with that, let me turn it over to our chairman. Thank you, Aaron, and uh, welcome. It's been two years, right? Since we have, maybe even longer since we have met. So it's great to see everybody in person. Uh, thank everybody for uh, making the trip downtown, which uh, I have not done in quite a, quite a bit of time. That's why we're, we're delayed with a couple of members uh, getting used to the new uh, uh, location and uh, certainly for all of us, uh, rush hour traffic uh, coming into, uh, into Chicago. But uh, because this meeting is still also uh, uh, involving a remote, uh, we remind everybody that uh, we're still allowed by uh, executive order of the governor to, uh, to have this meeting as a partial uh, a uh, remote meeting and uh, again, welcome. And with that in mind, I'll have Aaron read the roll call, please. All right, uh, Mayor Bennett. Present. President Brawley. Present. Mayor Darch. Present. Uh, Paul Goodrich. Present. You, Jim Healy. Nina Udamudia. Present. Mayor Noak. Here. President Reinbold. Present. Stephen Schaefer. Present. Carolyn Schofield. Here. Ann Sheehan? Here. Matt Walsh? Present. Diane Williams? Present. Leanne Redden? And uh, Dr. Muhammad, Muhammad Madian. Both of them. Uh, we have quorum. Great. Thank you. And uh, again, we, uh, un under the executive order, we are allowed to, to uh, have this meeting as a combination of, of both uh, in present and remote. And uh, for transparency, uh, all this is recorded and uh, available uh, upon request when done. Uh, first item in the agenda is the minutes of the June 8th meeting. I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes. So moved, Reinbold. Second, Walsh. Moved and seconded. Uh, any questions? If not, all those in favor will signify by a vote of aye. 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 Those opposed, a vote of no. Let me skip the roll call. I, you know what? I let me confer. Do we need to do the roll call still because we have the virtual? Because partial. I'm sorry. Okay. My apologies. So I will call the roll. Uh, Mayor Bennett. Aye. Frank Beal. Uh, President Brawley. Aye. Mayor Darch. Aye. Paul Goodrich. Aye. Healy. N Nina Itamudia. Aye. Mayor Noak. Aye. President Reinbold. Aye. Mayor Rotering. Stephen. Hello. Oh. Jim, is that you on the line? Jim Healy. Okay, we got you. Thank you. Um, Stephen Schaefer? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Aye. Ann Sheehan? Aye. Matt Walsh? Aye. Diane Williams? Aye. And I will um, go back to Jim Healy on the minutes. Was that an aye also? Aye for the minutes. Thank you so much. And a motion carries. Now I may lose you when I go into the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> we understand, Jim. Don't get lost, though, coming out. Uh, first item of the agenda is the executive director's report. All right. Well, um, a lot has happened over the summer. I know we've had a couple months off, but we have been working really closely with our congressional delegation um, to make sure that we're taking full advantage of the opportunities in front of us with the infrastructure bill and new federal funding for transportation projects. We've been leading a series of convenings with all of our major implementers around regionally significant projects that this region should get coordinated on. So we've had the transit agencies, Chicago Department of Transportation, the county DOTs, um, Amtrak and the CREATE program partners in Tollway convening on a monthly basis to discuss our top priorities. Again, one of the things that I wanna make sure that we're doing as a region is putting forth our most competitive projects at the right time so that we are not fighting amongst ourselves as we pursue a number, uh, any number of these um, competitive grant opportunities that are available of which there are like 20 of them. Uh, we had our second convening at the end of July to talk about project readiness. We brought in our partners from the Federal Highway Administration to talk about what they look at when they go over projects and score those projects. Again, we want to continue to convene this group um, and have a consensus list of projects uh, by the end of this year. Um, so that the beginning of next year, as we're all headed to DC, we can say that these are 
our project, our region's most competitive projects for programs and priorities. And so that your elected officials, yourself, and the partnerships and the organizations you belong to know where this region is placing all of its priorities here. It's not going to cover everything, but it will, I think, help us make sure that we're competitive. We know that other regions across the country are doing this as well. Um, we have already seen that some of this work that we've been doing is, is bearing fruit here. So in August, the region was awarded two $20 million uh, raise grants for the city of Chicago's Inglewood Trail Line and for Pace's Harvey Intermodal Transportation Center. Um, again, this year we had 39 total applications for raise. This year, two were selected, um, four were selected across the street the state and the goals of those projects were really thinking about the safety of pedestrians and bicyclists um, and thinking about how we target investment in historically disadvantaged communities. Again, we, like I said, we want to build consensus. We want to have that prioritized list of projects to move forward with again so that we can we can let DC know where we stand on these projects. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, moderating, a, moderating a panel yesterday with a number of our infrastructure projects with our WTS partners, again, with Federal Highways, and it was pretty exciting to hear just the variety of projects that all of our stakeholders have in the works, and I think there's a lot for us to be able to do. On that point, um, our team, I want to thank our team who's been working really hard um, with our county partners on a Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program. Um, we will apply for this funding um, and submit hit on, uh, hit submit on that on Thursday this at, of this week. Um, but really what we're working on is uh, making sure that we're improving travel safety across our region. Traffic deaths in Northeastern Illinois have increased a lot since 2019, 40% fatalities and serious injuries. And our most vulnerable users, people who aren't in vehicles, are the ones who, where we're also seeing um, really high increases of fatalities across the region. Uh, the grant program encourages multi-jurisdictional applications. Uh, we have our county friends at the table. This grant program will allow them to create uh, regional safety action plans or regional safe streets plans for their counties, which will allow our municipalities, our county partners, and other implementers um, the ability to apply for hard infrastructure funds overall, of which there will be about a billion dollars competitive available every year through this through this next four and a half years of the the infrastructure bill. So through this, um, we've got IDOT participating as well. So um, thanks to them, I think we've got a really strong proposal. We will be highly competitive. And given the I think the sad note of our fatalities increasing across the region as they are in many other major metro uh, areas, I do think we will be um, a strong candidate for uh, receipt of these funds. So $5 million uh, program for 24 months. So that goes in and we'll hope to hear good news in January on that. Over the past six months, we've also been talking to stakeholders from every corner of our region, again, about the infrastructure bill opportunities. Um, but one of the things that's uh, great for us as a planning organization is that there were increases in federal planning funds so that we can make sure that our agency is providing the foundational data, information, and analytics to help support projects move forward in meaningful ways. Um, we have attended many meetings in person and in virtually with your COGS and um, conferences with our counties as well. I know that our board recognizes that we rely on local contributions um, to meet our federal match requirements as well for planning funds at 8020. Um, these contributions make up 20% of CMAP's annual budget or about $880,000 from the local side. That combined with IDOT's three and a half million dollars contribution to the agency matches all of the federal planning funds that unlock all of the programming dollars that really go to your communities across the region here. Again, with the increase, um, we are working with our government partners to increase local contributions to make sure we're meeting that match. Uh, municipalities will see a 20% increase for next year and a 4% increase in subsequent years. Our larger agencies, including our counties, the city and tollway will see increases, uh, larger increases. Um, it's important to note that local contributions have remained steady since 2016, since they were first implemented at the agency. But you know, I don't take these increases lightly. I recognize that we need to have a multi-pronged strategy here. So combined with that, we are working on um, a legislative strategy um, to increase funds to the agency um, in a more general manner to provide and fulfill all of the requirements of our agency um, and working with our other large partners to, to think about creative solutions to making sure that we aren't leaving any dollars on the, on the table here. So I am happy to answer any specific questions you might have on our local contributions increases, but the communities will see that um, in the fall when we send out our, our uh, invoices. Any questions regarding it? Have we begun an outreach 
to we each have. of the COGS? Yep, we have been to almost all of the COGS in person or virtually. Um, and then I have a couple more meetings with our county partners teed up as well. But um, so far, I think, you know, I, I think people understand the value of the work that we do here at the agency. I also had the opportunity to meet with the legislative team uh, regarding a potential funding downstate again, as we have uh, not had it from day one. Um, I always, I've always nagged the executive director over the years about re revisiting uh, that legislation, which created us, but provided no source of funding to support us. The uh, idea would be to have a permanent, not, not a, uh, uh, a whimsical uh, once a year, maybe, maybe not uh, to have some, something, whether it's going to regard being written into law or, and, or just part of a, a, a law that indicates that it'll be a continuing appropriation going forward. Uh, I don't want to have that done and not know each year that it's going to be returned. So there's going to be some, uh, some conversations and how we can approach that or how we can go about doing that for permanent funding. But uh, we thank our, our, all of our members for, for their financial support. Uh, over the years and again as Aaron has indicated it's been uh, almost six years it'll be over six years uh, plus since uh, we raised our uh, contributions but I think the benefit that has gone out to the cities and villages and counties over the years have been incredible uh, the return on investment so to speak so hopefully there's uh, a, a great buy-in as to the increase go going forward but thank you Aaron any other questions for Aaron I have just two other, uh, uh, maybe three other quick things I wanted to mention that we are um, uh, going to announce a, a technical assistance call for projects again. It's uh, something that we do about annually. Again, we'll partner with RTA on our annual call for projects, but by working together, we have one streamlined application. Um, later this month, uh, we'll, the application will be made available and communities can begin to apply. Again, um, really, we've been focused on our communities who are asking, how do I take advantage of the federal infrastructure funds? How do we make sure that our communities are prepared? And our, our team has been um, pivoting and, and thinking about like less long range comprehensive plans for communities, but more strategic opportunities for them to be able to really um, pivot and take advantage of some of the resources that are available. So more practical application. And to that, let me just say thank you to my planning team who's been doing the lion's share of that work. Um, and then next week we have our uh, quarterly meeting with our county board chairs. We are doing so in Joliet. Um, this meeting will sort of be the bookend of, of two years of work that we've been doing on joint economic strategies across the region. Um, the county board chairs charged CMAP and the city of Chicago to work together on our regional economic opportunities and growth post COVID. Um, this was supported by a grant from funds at the Searle, uh, from the Searle funds at the Chicago Community Trust, but we partnered with the Brookings Institution to come in and look at what our opportunities are related to economic growth, how we can work collaboratively as a regional um, body, and we've got um, all of our economic development organizations at the table as well as World Business Chicago. Um, I do think, you know, uh, that we will have some really positive outcomes from this, and I know that World Business Chicago is going to be providing more regional technical data and information to our county EDOs, and then I think from which our local municipal EDOs will really benefit from. So again, we'll have a more formal announcement on that, but I'm excited about this work and wanted to share that with you all. Uh, lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about rail. I know that many of us are concerned about the uh, freight rail strike. I, I, you know, I think there is probably some things that we don't know will happen, but um, I think also speaking of rail, we've been paying close attention to the Canadian Pacific Kansas City Southern merger and the work that's been going on at the Surface Transportation Board as well. Um, last month, there was a draft EIS released. My staff is analyzing that right now. Um, looking to form a response and really helping to understand what the impacts are to our local communities across the region, the potential impacts related to safety at grade crossings, which is a huge, huge concern for our region that we don't want to see um, perpetuated. So um, comment period has been extended till October 14th, but if you would like to see our comments, um, we are happy to share those so that your organizations can amplify those. And then in closing, um, on the agenda today, our, our staff will be talking a little bit about the draft 2050 plan update that we have next month at the joint meeting on October 12th. We are anticipating or will be asking for your support in approving the draft plan update along with the MPO policy committee. Um, as a reminder, this report really does meet our federal requirements that we have in front of us. The purpose is to adjust our data and analysis um, and look at our, our budgets out to 2050. Um, we will be holding this meeting at Chicago's Union Station 
Foundation. They've off graciously offered um, space and there is a great mega program application in for um, improving access at Union Station as well. And I think they would love to highlight um, some of the elements of the grant proposal and maybe we'll even know if they've received that award. So that concludes my report. Again, I'm happy to answer. Any questions, questions Baron? If not, we'll move on to uh, procurements and contracts. We have a new, our new uh, finance director, uh, Peter Vitacek, is that close? <laughs> Very good, welcome, Peter. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor Bennett, Executive Director Aleman, um, and all members of the board. Uh, as a matter of introduction, as uh, Mayor Bennett said, my name is Peter Getchuk, and I am the new Director of Finance here at CMAP. Um, I just do want to take this opportunity um, before I get to business to thank uh, Executive Director uh, Aleman, as well as Chief of Staff Amy McEwen for their continuing support of the finance and admin team during this time of transition. Um, as we all know, Angela's departure did leave a void within the division, um, but she did leave a good structure and base that allowed us to move forward and continue in providing the necessary operational functions for the organization and more. Um, I look forward to providing updates on our progress and success in the coming months. So um, on that note, first for your consideration is a cost increase and additional services for Oats Associates Inc. Um, the, car, the vendor is currently partnering with CMAP in lieu with the, <clears throat> excuse me, with the ADA transition plan training project. And today we are seeking board approval for the addition of a pilot training module and two additional training modules <clears throat> from the vendor for an additional cost of $54,610, which would result in a new not to exceed amount of $212,006. Uh, the contract will be supported by the FY23 and FY24 operating grants. Um, at this time, I'll ask if there are any questions. If not, CMAP Great Finance board. respectfully requests the board's approval. We do, uh, we do have two others. Oh, so if we would like to look at them, uh, no, we could do it all together if that's the preference. I could, I, I could go through all of them. Sounds yes, good. And, and Peter, if you could move the microphone a little closer. So. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, next for your consideration are two IGAs supporting the Cook County Tax Working Group in cooperation with the University of Illinois at Chicago. The IGAs would be three-year IGAs with both UIC and Cook County, funded by Cook County in the amount of $1.5 million. CMAP will be working uh, with UIC and Cook County in order to address challenges in support of the Cook County Property Tax Working Group. CMAP staff will conduct process mapping exercise and partner with UIC faculty to conduct analysis of costs and benefits of granting property tax abatements. Cook County will provide funding support for this initiative in the amount of, of $1.5 million. And finally, for your consideration is a res resolution regarding an IGA with the Cook County Assessor's Office in relation to data uh, from tax year 2020. The Cook County Assessor's Office has a geographic information database that is willing to make available to CMAP at no cost. This will allow CMAP staff an additional tool to utilize to facilitate in the decision-making process in respect to planning for the region. At this time, I'll see if there are any questions. Are there questions of uh, those items? If not, I'll entertain a motion that we uh, adopt or approve, I'm sorry, uh, 501, 502, and 503. Is there a motion? Motion by Noak. Second by Sheehan. Moved and seconded. Aaron, call the roll, please. Thank you. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Frank Beal? President Brawley? Yes. Mayor Darch? Yes. Paul Goodrich? Aye. Jim Healy? Yes, Nina? <laughs> Nina Edamudia? Aye. Uh, Mayor Noak? Aye. President Reinbold? Aye. Mayor Rotering? Stephen Schaefer? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. Ann Sheehan? Yes. And Matt Wall. Oh, Matt Walsh? Yes. And Diane Williams? Yes. Motion carries? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And welcome aboard. Next item is item six on committee reports. Who's going to give that? So actually um, attached in your agenda is the annual report for the board's review. If there are any questions on the Regional Economic uh, Committee, um, we're happy to entertain them, but I wanted to let you all know that with the implementation of the new committee structure that we have, um, we want to make sure that we're formalizing the communications from our regional economy, our climate, and our transportation committees up through the board. So um, this report is provided for your informational purposes, but I do, we do have the committee liaisons, Austin Edwards and Do Dominic Argumento here um, to answer any questions should you have any. Thank you. <clears throat> Under item seven, it's the nominations of the CMAP uh, uh, officials, uh, attachments. There's a memorandum of uh, nomination of the executive committee recommendations. 
and there was a chair there, right? Yes, so um, included again in your packet is a memo from the, um, the group that you asked to evaluate the nominations to the executive committee. Um, Read that please. Here. Okay. Here we go. So um, on August 5th, the nominating advisory group to Mayor Bennett met, which compri was comprised of Nina Itamudia, um, President Darch, and Matt Walsh. Um, we had representation from City of Chicago, which was Nina, uh, President Darch, Collar Counties, and Matt Walsh representing Cook and Suburban Cook. Um, the committee met and submitted the following names as officers and members of the executive committee for this next year. Um, you'll see in the memo that uh, we continue the the recommendation was to continue having Mayor Bennett as chair, uh, Vice Chair Carolyn Schofield representing the Collar Counties, and Sheehan as Vice Chair representing City of Chicago, um, and then three at-large members, Diane Williams, Paul Goodrich, and Mayor Noak from um, their respected uh, parts of the region here. So the nominating advisory group believes that the slate should uh, does continue to represent the agency um, and the geographic balance of the organization. Having uh, been submitted that report, uh, is there a motion to accept that recommendation? Uh, I'll make a motion, Walsh. Second, Darch. Moved and seconded. Any questions? Aaron, call the roll. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Frank Beal. President Brawley. Yes. Mayor Darch. Yes. Paul Goodrich. Yes. Healy. Nina Itamudia. Aye. Mayor Noak. President R Mayor Noak. He's out of the tunnel. Yes. Thank you. Uh, President Reinbold. Aye. Mayor Rotering. Stephen Schaefer. Aye. Uh, Carolyn Schofield. Yes. Ann Sheehan. Yes. Matt Walsh. Yes. Diane Williams. Yes. Ask the board recognize that Jim Healy, thank you, is here in person. Thank you. The motion carries. Jim, welcome. I gave myself an hour and a half, but it worked. Sorry, Mayor Noak's still out there somewhere. Oh, I said yes. <laughs> thank you, and thank you uh, for the board for the support of uh, a continuation of leadership, not only by myself, but the other members of the uh, executive committee. Uh, we will again continue to strive to uh, work uh, to make this agency effective in the, in the uh, metro area. So thank you. Moving on to item eight, it's the plan update uh, that is being given by. Uh, this morning, uh, we have a presentation from Jonathan Birch um, on the 2050 plan update, and um, I believe we have a recorded presentation, and then Jonathan and Elizabeth are here in person to answer questions that you may have. So why don't we go ahead and move forward with the recording? Good morning. My name is Jonathan Birch, a CMAP staffer, and I'm here to talk this morning about the process for updating onto 2050. This is a critical moment in the plan update process. My colleague Elizabeth Scott provided you an in-depth presentation at your June meeting about the plan update, covering various components, why are they important, and what contributions they provide to the overall planning effort. Since then, CMAP held a public comment period for the draft plan from June 10th until August 13th. On August 11th, we held a public hearing both online and at CMAP's offices. Today, I will again be covering a bit about what's in the plan, but the bulk of the time will be spent summarizing the public comment we received. On Friday, the Transportation Committee will also hear about the public comment received on the plan, as well as deciding whether to recommend its approval to the Board and MPO Policy Committee for action in October. As a reminder, today's presentation is informational to give you a sense of what we heard in public comment. We are not asking the Board to take action on the plan update. As a reminder, what is the plan update? It is both a technical exercise and a policy setting exercise. The plan update is also an opportunity to reflect on sub the substantial progress that has been made on many onto 2050 recommendations. The plan update describes how the experiences of the last four years reaffirm onto, onto 2050's principles of inclusive growth, resilience, and prioritized investment. 
It charts our progress toward goals, celebrates implementation successes over the last four years, and reiterates the key goals of the community, prosperity, environment, governance, and mobility sections of the original plan. It identifies key findings from the update processes, provides analysis on important changes in our forecasted population, transportation investments, and funding resources. It maps the path forward, where we go from here to put onto 2050's recommendations and strategies into action. And finally, it includes a number of technical appendices that cover many aspects of the plan development in greater detail, including the evaluation of regionally significant projects, the development of the socioeconomic forecast, and the financial plan. Engagement efforts for the plan update help CMAP hone in on those planning priorities that are most important to the public and CMAP's various stakeholders. Both those areas that can be addressed are acknowledged through this planning process, as well as those that will need to set the stage for future planning processes. That engagement includes the public comment period and public hearing I referenced earlier. We ended up receiving more than 500 comments from local governments, advocates, and the public. The next few slides highlight key themes from the public comments, showing a public comment that is emblematic of the feedback we received on that point, while I talk a bit about CMAP's response to these comments. In your package, you should have received a memo that also highlights these themes, CMAP's response to these themes, as well as a PDF of all the public comments we received. Commenters expressed concern about the inclusion of roadway expansion projects as regionally significant projects due to their climate impacts. CMAP notes that the plan update reaffirms the regional goal of developing a multimodal transportation system and maintains onto 2050's call to intensify climate mitigation efforts. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the region requires compact infill development, improved pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, and increased investments in public transit, as well as considerable expansion of renewable energy systems, energy efficiency and retrofits, and electri electrification of our transportation system. CMAP will continue to work across these many areas to mitigate climate impacts and recover from the impacts of climate change. CMAP is continuously evaluating regional performance measures and adjusting our tools and processes for understanding the impacts of transportation improvements on the quality of life across the region. This includes how we model roadway expansions as well as advances in greenhouse gas emission modeling. Commenters emphasize the importance of continuing to make investments and update policies to improve transportation safety and accessibility in the region, particularly for vulnerable travelers. CMAP believes that there is much work to be done in the region on transportation safety and accessibility. CMAP launched a program to improve regional traffic safety, including by creating new safety data resources on issues like speeding, competing for planning and capital funds and convening regional stakeholders to promote joint problem solving. CMAP is currently developing a report of legislative recommendations to support the region's transit system in consultation with the Regional Transportation Authority. The report will address transit safety considerations insofar as the user experience is critical to public confidence in the system, system ridership, and, and transit employee hiring and retention. CMAP is also launching a program to help every community in Northeastern Illinois establish an Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan over the next 10 years. Additionally, the agency is currently exploring new ways to explore, support the region's dial-a-ride services and better integrate them into a broader mobility system. The next theme, commenters express the preference that new funding coming to the region be fairly allocated in a transparent and performance-based manner. The new Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IAJA, seeks to make transformative transportation investments that advance equity, environmental, climate, resilience, and safety goals. Those federal goals align with the plan updates core principles of inclusive growth, resilience, and prioritized investment. As a coordinating regional agency, CMAP is a resource to all communities and counties in northeastern Illinois. Since IHAA became law, CMAP has focused on leveraging the increased infrastructure funding for our region, coordinating around new competitive grant programs, and preparing regionally significant projects. 
CMAP believes that developing clear, transparent, and reasonably supported methods for prioritizing projects in IAJA funding upholds the plan updates core principles, improves the region's competitiveness for discretionary federal funds, and accelerates progress towards regional goals. Commenters broadly express support for non-single occupancy vehicle modes, including walking, biking, and transit, and proposed a variety of ways that CMAP and the region should encourage residents to travel by these modes. In general, CMAP devotes a significant portion of its annual work plan to projects that support residents' ability to travel by active modes. These recent examples include the Regional Sidewalk Inventory and the Northern Lakeshore Trails Connectivity Plan. Historically, bicycle and pedestrian projects have not been specifically included in the regionally significant projects list because of their relatively small capital cost. They are, however, accounted for within the financial plan for transportation in the system enhancements category. This category includes capital and operational enhancements or improvements not already constrained in other categories. Examples include bicycle, pedestrian, and ADA improvements, as well as highway management and operations, including intelligent transportation systems. The plan update provides $43.7 billion in enhancements investments between now and 2050. For the next regional plan, CMAP commits to improving transparency of these investments to better support their critical role in advancing the region's goals. Commenters expressed concern over the loss of farmland due to development in the region. CMAP provides technical assistance to urban, suburban, and rural communities. Our technical assistance helps us better understand the issues and specific needs of rural communities. We look forward to exploring how we can better use local work to inform our regional approaches. And in the upcoming year, CMAP will begin scoping for the next regional plan. And this com these comments will be helpful as we consider how to approach that work. Commenters oppose the inclusion of the Tri-County Access Project in Lake County as a regionally significant project. The Tri-County Access Project was not submitted for evaluation as a regionally significant project for the ONTO 2050 plan update. Therefore, it is not included in the plan's regionally significant project list, which can be found on the CMAP website. As noted earlier, on Friday, the Transportation Committee will also hear about the public comment received on the plan update, as well as deciding whether to recommend its approval to the Board and MPO Policy Committee at their October meeting. As a reminder, today's presentation is informational. To give you a sense of what we heard in public comment, we are not asking the Board to take action today on the plan update. Thank you again for your time. Please, note, please let us know if you have any comments or questions. Thank you. Is there a second report? Uh, no, at this time, if there are questions, uh, comments, Elizabeth and Daniel, who have been co leading the update plan process, um, we're happy to hear them. Okay. Absolutely. Um, in, in reading through the one of the reports, um, I was impressed with sort of the modeling effort that you go through and, and how everything is broken down. Um, in the transportation area, the mobility, my trips survey data sounds like it's the basis for a lot of your of your modeling. So my question is, how often do you look at either for the as you prepare a plan or looking back ten years, compare real data like trips, RTA, with what you've modeled, what's going on, and and then you know in the look back, seeing how accurate you were um, and how that affects what you're doing now. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Mayor. Um, so neither Jonathan nor I are modelers, so please just take this with a grain of salt. Craig, but modeler. Craig is here. There's a modeler in the room. Are you kidding? This is CMAP. We have modelers are all over the place. Morning, I'm Craig Aether, the principal travel modeler. Uh, that's a great question. So we do, you know, yes, first of all, about the, the survey. So that's something that MPOs typically do on roughly every 10 years or so. Um, we have, are starting to scope out as something that's going to do it on a much more frequent basis um, to help us get a better sense of sort of where the region is at since the, the last one was finished just before COVID hit. So it's a good snapshot of what things were like, but we want to get a better sense of how things are starting or whether or not they are getting back to normal. So when we do undertake those, um, that is 
as you mentioned, the basis for us updating our travel models to make sure that we're reflecting the travel behavior that we're currently seeing. And so when we do that, uh, we do take a look at how things have changed in between different surveys. Mayor, I think if we have been given reports, as you recall, when we were, we were remote on some of those travel uh, travel um, um, models regarding uh, use of uh, through the RTA, you know, the various um, uh, trains, buses. Uh, I don't know. I know where you're coming from. I, I don't know if they're ready to project them going forward uh, because we had a two year period of, of, of such a, a, a fluctuation in travel mode. Uh, right. Do you think we're back to normal? Uh, certainly not on the transit side. On on the, the highway side, yeah, I mean, traffic congestion is- We know that, right, Mayor? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess uh, the, um, where I'm going is, I, you know, I, I understand that, but do you ever test your model against actual data? So I can look and find out how many people are getting on the train every day from the Barrington station. Metra has sure. that. So how do you- when do you look at your model against what the real numbers are? We do, we, it's, it's called validating the model. Uh, we don't do it quite to the, uh, the granularity that you're talking about looking at the individual transit station, but that is one thing that we do. Uh, we look at um, annual average daily traffic counts on different segments of the highways. We look at transit boardings, uh, like by Metro line or by the CTA rail lines to see how those uh, measure up. And we actually are now in the process of completing the work for the new model that we used for the plan update. So that should be published uh, later in this fiscal year. Great, thank you. Any other questions, Mayor? I would just add to that. Um, I, I think we're far off on the transit still, yes. And I still think we're, there's still a lot to play out on the traffic side as well. Um, I don't think we're back there. No, I was stuck in traffic and that was horrible. Uh, but, uh, and that also probably had to do with the three accidents, you know, the diversions off of 80 and numerous other things that are going on. But I think we're still in a very rapid period of change coming off of COVID. Um, you know, I think things like e-commerce, the, their effects on traffic patterns are still evolving and pretty rapidly faster than you can model. Uh, you know, so I think there's still an evolution. I think we still have to see what suburban office markets do. It, there's a lot still happening. So... I, I caution that it may, we may be into some normalcy, in, on, regrettably, on interstates, uh, but what the effect is throughout the entire system, I think, is still yet to be seen. Oh, I agree. It's an unprecedented period of time. I agree. And plus, with the major construction that's going on roadways uh, throughout the metropolitan area, that's another uh, interesting uh, uh, addition to what's currently a problem uh, versus in two or three years, so when a lot of that should be done, especially in a major uh, Interstates and uh, roadways, um, how that how that has impacted, uh, how, you know, how people are moving around the region. I think one of the other things that we're seeing too, just to add a little bit to, I think your experience this morning getting here, um, is that we are seeing average daily, daily traffic uh, on our expressways as higher than um, 2019, and I think for passenger vehicles, correct me if I'm wrong, Craig is like, uh, you know, five to ten percent higher for for those vehicles, but I think for the small freight and delivery, those B-class plates, um, even higher. Even so higher, yeah. Like 15% over yep. 2019 numbers. Um, the the world is shifting. I think we just aren't sure um, what it could look like and what's what, what's going to be our new reality. Yeah, I, I, I you take any one e-commerce, for example, and because we do a lot of that, obviously, um, but even in shifts in demand with them and reconsolidation and kind of right sizing for their industries coming off COVID off of a peak into a new period, it's still evolving. It's evolving so quickly that, I mean, every six months it changes. It's a challenge, it will be a challenge. Thank you. No other questions? Oh. All right. Let, let me just say, just in closing, before we move on, I think the next topic is, is is similarly related, but I think, again, this is really what we need your guidance and expertise on as we begin to embark on the next long-range plan, is understanding from your parts of the region what we should be doing and how we should be planning to address this into the future um, as a regional agency. So. All right, moving on. Item 10. We're moving along here. Uh, item 10 is public comment. Any... Did I skip something? We did. 
Oh, I'm sorry. 8.02, we do have, um, I think, a, a related presentation on our mobility recovery work. So long range plan, right? A big 30 year plan for the region. We recognized when COVID hit that we needed to start thinking about sort of what are the short term and midterm mobility recovery strategies we need to be thinking about. So I think this will tee off nicely uh, from the comments that we just heard. Um, we're wrapping up a study of, of how people's movements have changed post COVID. And we can go ahead and uh, I think hit play on this. Is there another presentation? Uh, yep, another oh, quick presentation here. Good morning. My name is Daniel Como, and I'm a senior policy analyst on the regional policy and implementation team here at CMAP. Today, I'll be giving a brief update on the agency's mobility recovery initiative, which we've shared with this group before, and which we are now in the process of finalizing. I'll also be providing you with a preview on how that work, mobility recovery, will connect to the agency's upcoming efforts to deliver recommendations to the Illinois General Assembly on the region's transit system. As a reminder, the goal of our mobility recovery project is to overcome what we're calling the medium term transportation challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's thinking over the next two to five years, how can we continue to make progress toward the goals of documents like Onto 2050 and Invest in Transit, but reflecting the changes that we've all experienced as a result of the pandemic over the last two years. As part of that work, we've benchmarked mobility policies from around the US and around the world. We've done research in terms of what we can already see has changed in terms of employment and housing, when and where people travel, how often they're working remotely. We've used the agency's travel models to understand what different versions of the future might look like here in our region. And we've taken all of that along with engagement with communities and stakeholders throughout the region to identify what kinds of solutions might make sense in response to these changes. And so what I'm going to do today is to present a preview on that final element of this list, the recommended list of strategies, which we are targeting to have uh, completed and released sometime in October, uh, so next month. I wanted to highlight just one example of the kinds of analysis that we've done through this project. And this is something that we've shared previously, but it really is quite important. And so I wanna highlight again, we expect telework or remote work to be significantly higher after the pandemic than it was before. And so before COVID-19, we, we might've estimated that on an average weekday, under one in 10 regional employees would be working remotely. After COVID-19, we think that that might look more like up to a quarter of employees on an average weekday. And on the right-hand side of this slide, we've highlighted in dark blue, the areas of jobs where this is likely to be the largest factor. And while there are some clusters in places that you might expect, such as downtown Chicago, we also see large numbers of centers of employment throughout the region that are gonna have lots of their employees working remotely at least some of the time. Of course, up to a quarter is a lot of employees. It is not a majority of employees. And so even while we have a system that has more people working remotely more of the time, we still are gonna have many people traveling to work and traveling for all of the other things that they rely on the transportation system for every day. But what we wanted to spend more time sharing with you today is the recommendations that we anticipate will come out of this project. The first of these is that we anticipate that we're going to need to identify and enact new revenues for transit. You may have previously heard that the RTA is estimating the region's transit service boards will face a combined $730 million operating budget gap in 2026. But that's after federal aid is exhausted, which is currently supporting transit operations here in our region. As you see on the right hand side of this slide, this is not a unique problem for us. It's a problem that we're gonna be sharing with other large transit systems, especially the, the legacy transit systems in cities like Philadelphia and New York. And we think that closing that gap, that very large operating funding gap is going to require us to find and enact new revenues for transit. In the Mobility Recovery Project, we've talked in particular about revenue sources like reforms to the sales tax, such as broadening the base to include more services. We've also talked about exploring revenues that come from the roadway system, things like tolling, congestion pricing, or road usage charges. And we've also explored what sorts of things we might work with the state to consider 
reforms that might direct additional investments into the region's transit operating budgets. But in addition to pursuing new revenues for transit, we've also spent a lot of time in the Mobility Recovery Project thinking about what kinds of improvements we could make to our region's transit system and the sorts of things that we've seen during the pandemic that we really need to be responding to. And one of those, we think, is to focus on improving our region's bus service. Now, during COVID-19, our region's bus services, both for CTA and for PACE, have maintained higher levels of their ridership than other transit modes. And that's because our buses disproportionately serve the kinds of riders that were more likely to stay on transit throughout the pandemic. And we think that we need to respond accordingly and we need to make investments to improve the service that those riders rely on. And we think that we can do that relatively quickly and relatively affordably through things like investments in dedicated bus lanes, uh, through investments in things like automated camera enforcement that could allow those bus lanes or bus stops to be free and clear for the buses that need to move through them. And we're also thinking about what kinds of investments might be required in terms of public sector staff capacity so that these ideas can go from the idea stage into implementation relatively quickly. We're also going to highlight opportunities to improve integration across our region's transit system as well as to make sure that it's affordable to all travelers. And we have some great recent examples to learn from, like the Regional Connect Pass, which you may have heard about uh, and was recently launched, which makes traveling by transit throughout the region easier and more affordable. We also can look at the Fair Transit Pilot, supported by Cook County, which has improved access to mobility in both South Cook and North Will counties. We want to continue and build on these efforts and work toward a system where travelers can transfer easily and affordably between all of our region's transit modes. And we want to explore how we can better integrate complementary options like Divi into these trips. As we do that work, we're also going to be highlighting potential opportunities to do things like subsidize fares for low-income residents. But on all of this, we're also going to highlight the need to fund it so that the transit operators can continue to provide the service that our region depends on. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected far more than just our region's transit system. And another topic that we've spent a lot of time exploring in this work is the impacts on all kinds of active and sustainable modes like walking and biking and how those have been impacted by the increase in unsafe driving behaviors that we've seen during the pandemic. And so we've developed some recommendations in response to this that we think relate to the infrastructure that you need to promote these modes to make them safer and more attractive to use. Things like promoting the adoption of complete and safe streets, thinking about how we can use both short-term interventions like pop-up traffic calming, but also longer-term right-sizing of roadways. We've highlighted on the slide uh, an example from Barcelona where they, they really repurposed much of the space on interior portions uh, of streets and left through traffic to go you know, outside of uh, what they call a super block. But we think that there are opportunities to do these kinds of investments, you know, investments in continuous networks of bike lanes, sidewalks and paths, the kinds of investments in shared streets that we saw done on a pop-up basis throughout the region during the pandemic. We think there are real opportunities to do that in a more sustained and widespread basis throughout the region. Uh, and so we're gonna be highlighting that as well in the upcoming report. Again, that's just a brief preview of the kinds of materials that we'll be sharing in our final report on the Mobility Recovery Project. In addition to those, we'll have recommendations related to topics like development patterns that support active and sustainable modes the sorts of connections that employers can make to improve access for their employees and how we can think about mitigating the challenges that come along with increased freight and e-commerce with investments in things like electrification. But now I'm going to transition into where we see this work going and especially how it could feed into the agency's responsibilities to develop recommendations for the Illinois General Assembly on our region's transit system. 
As you may be aware, the governor recently signed legislation that requires CMAP to produce a report of recommendations regarding the region's transit system. And so we have some details about it here on the screen. It has to focus on the long-term financial viability of the region's uh, transit system. And we see many of the recommendations coming out of the mobility recovery report as an important input for the development of, of these recommendations. Now, it's going to be overseen by a steering committee of regional stakeholders. We are still in the process of standing that up, uh, but we are working uh, toward an ultimate deadline of submitting this recommendation report to the Illinois General Assembly by January 1st of 2024. And we are planning for it to be adopted by the CMAP board and MPO policy committee in late 2023. So you should expect much more uh, about this in the coming months, but we just wanted to highlight that we are actively thinking about it and planning for how the work coming out of mobility recovery will feed into the development of this program of recommendations. That's it for me for today. Thank you very much for your time and attention. My colleague Elizabeth Scott will be happy to answer any questions that you might have about today's presentation. Any questions? Go ahead. Good, good morning. Um, you know, um, I think your presentation was excellent, um, but I, I, one glaring um, issue that was not mentioned was the amount of violence um, and the safety of public transportation. Um, we can do all this wonderful planning, but people aren't going to use public transportation if it's not safe. And, um, you know, uh, I have a 24-year-old daughter who lives in the city, and she won't use public transportation because it's not safe. Uh, so I, I think to ignore that as an issue and to not have funding for that or some type of um, confidence in the system that it's going to be safe to use um, would be a mistake. Good point. Yeah, Matt. thank you. That's something that we've been really hearing a lot, talking to people about what are the needs for our transit system are. And um, certainly our partners at the service boards are putting together some plans of action that they themselves will undertake around transit ambassadors, advanced you know, cleaning and security protocols. And um, uh, but I completely I completely agree that we could design and implement the best service in the world. But if people don't feel that it's safe, they won't use it. So that safety, affordability, accessibility, efficiency are really, I think, need to be top of mind when we're talking about getting people to come back to transit. But in the presentation, I didn't hear anything about safety. And I think that has to be the first. It has to be because people aren't going to use public transportation if it's not safe. They're not. And it is in our scope of work for the report for the General Assembly. But, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's when we do this presentation again, we'll be sure to highlight that. Yeah, that's a good I point, a and I think uh, the question going forward for the partners involved in the discussion is certainly the, the problem that we see right now, whether it's the responsibility and or the action by the agency itself, CTA, PACE, or Metro, or any other agency, and the local law enforcement. And I guess those two partners need to sit down uh, to design a plan, and more importantly, if it is going to go to the General Assembly, a recommendation on funding for something like that outside of the normal planning and, and development and construction and improvements to our, our uh, transit agencies, I guess that is really a, a sidebar, but, but should be part of the overall consideration of the plan going forward as to funding of that. Because those two, those two partners know the best as to how effectively that can be done. But as always, it's going to be a question of, of financial support in making it safe. Yeah, I, have, I guess I have a question to follow up to Member Walsh's um, statement. I guess, how are we quantifying safety? Are we saying like, or do we have statistics that we're relying on that a certain type of crime has gone up on public transit? Are we just talking about perceived safety? I take, I live in Chicago, I take public transit all the time. I've never felt unsafe. So I guess what, before we look into well, we should talk about safety because, of course, when I see police officers on the train, I freeze up. Uh, that's my perception of safety, right? My definition of safety is different. So what I would want you all to do is quantify what do you mean by safety? What types of crime are we talking about? Where is that perceived crime happening? Do we have statistics to actually back that up? Or is it just the perception that public transit is unsafe? Um, and so those are the things I would want you to look at instead of just blanketly looking at safety. That's what I said about the partnership of both the the, the, uh, the agencies themselves and the Chicago Police Department and or suburban police departments. They would have those facts. They would have those reports. Right. They would have that information to define 
in effect, you can see an approach now, at least is a temporary interim uh, about targeting certain areas, but overall, uh, you're correct that, you know, this should also be based upon fact, but you need those two people to come together and sit down and, and understand or find out what those, what those facts are all about and how do you address it? All right. And I have, yeah, just to build off this conversation, one additional metric I didn't hear in the presentation, which may be well within the scope is around um, quantifying health benefits kind of in the same vein as safety. And so recognizing the, the shift to more active, more sustainable modes comes with health benefits overall. Um, how is that being factored into this? Because that also has a corollary on residents, you know, quality of life, ability to live healthy lifestyles, um, free of pollution. Um, so recognizing, you know, and thinking back to the first presentation, uh, the public comment around the need for transparent, you know, prioritization, right? What are the criteria? Um, how does that factor in and how does that relate to the different modes that are being considered, for example, for, for investment? So, um, you know, our criteria around public health, in addition to safety, for example, being weighted and how so, and how does that actually on balance um, play out as it relates to the different modes that are being considered for that investment? Uh, just to kind of reiterate John's comment before, and I think one uh, where I was going um, yesterday, I think in our uh, council mayor's meeting, but the, the two- Here, I'm year, sorry, can you pull that up closer to me? Oh, I'm sorry. The um, two year time frame, transforming transit in two years, just that caution about we're coming out of COVID still. So if we're in this next two year time frame, I'm not sure we know what's what. So you hate to transform it to something that isn't gonna really match how life is after that. So I, I, the ideas were great in the presentation, a lot of that, but how do you, I think you just have to be cautious in how we do and, and uh, implement this. Yeah, again, I would think that the committee and the report would reflect that. Uh, you know, with things changing monthly, yearly, uh, there's probably best a snapshot in time, uh, but certainly from a from being reasonable also about a long-term plan, which we are responsible for mid-long-term plan. Uh, I think certainly they're gonna come up with uh, some guidelines or recommendations uh, in consideration of everything going on. Otherwise we'd be here every, every week changing changing plans. And uh, you know, that's why we have this agency is to do a little bit more long long-term planning. Are there any members on uh, on uh, remote that have any questions? Nope. I have one more question. Yeah, so um, lovely presentation, really excited about this. Um, wondering though, if there's any um, pursuit of information about like not uh, mobility in the right of way, but how private development affects uh, you know, Chicago just adopted the Connected Communities Ordinance. I think there's some really good meaty regulation in there for the private um, development that influences the right of way. And I'm wondering if you, if your team is in, in looking at that and seeing how other cities may be able around the region may be able to adopt similar things. Uh, absolutely. That's uh, thinking about how we can learn from the Connected Communities experience and think about a uh, context sensitive sort of suburban version of how we might encourage density around transit is definitely part of what is considered here. You know, and just a piece of perspective for you all is, you know, the state has asked us to bring this report of recommendations. And so one of the lenses that we're looking through it on is what are actions the state would need to take to create or enable or change the rules or somehow facilitate the recommendations that we're trying to bring forward. And I think um, definitely the transit supportive land use is a place that's worth thinking about. No specific recommendations at this time, but it's on the agenda to discuss with the steering committee and further develop. Other questions? Just, just one more qu question. Um, thinking about the modeling uh, that was, mm -hmm. was showing up, just how how is... Um, is there like a measure of kind of pent up or like latent demand for different forms, like recognizing there is public comment for, you know, different types of, of investments that would encourage mode shift? And so how does the modeling in the, in the planning, current planning, like capture the fact that um, the infrastructure that may exist today may not actually be reflective of, of kind of the demand that could, could exist in the future? 
That's an excellent question. Um, and so one of the pieces that you know you, you all just heard in the last presentation from my colleague, Craig Heather, and one of the pieces that we're working on scoping the development of this report is to think about how we can bring our modeling tools to bear to some of these research questions in a little bit more speculative way. So like, for instance, if we were to uh, create new service or increase a certain type of service, what, would, what could we expect uh, would be the reaction of users. And so we're going to have a, rain, a range of hypotheses that we're going to explore and use that as part of um, the reasoning for the set of recommendations that we uh, bring to the General Assembly. Because absolutely, it's like, like it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem. So people, this is the system we have today, and this is how people are reacting to it. But if we change the system and we change the incentive structure, what could we expect? And, and so, yeah, we're definitely planning to do that. Just a, a off your comment regarding density around transit and suburban areas, let's caution that, that that's not always a possibility. And remember that, keep that in mind, and what may work in the city may not work in, frankly, what works in DuPage may not work in Will. It, there's a lot of diversity out there, a lot of geography, a lot of topography, a lot of realities, so let's be careful about it. Yes, and and we know that that not not every station area would be is appropriate, and not every you know community has that kind of land use in their local plans, um, and that and that in some places it might look like um, supporting job center um, that's actually transit connected. Uh, in in other places it might look like more residential, but we would have it it would it, it greatly depends on the local context what actually makes sense. I, I, if I may, I think the agency over the years has has tried not to be cookie cutter. That yeah. we have staff has really drilled down on on the the, the various metropolitan area with Chicago suburban or, or county, and I think and certainly they will continue in that direction. Uh, but I understand, Mayor, about uh, uh, or even a question about how do we go forward when maybe we don't even understand a changing time today. So I think we have a great staff that can put all those pieces of the puzzle together and come up with. Uh, a recommendation again these are it's going to be important because this is going to the general assembly so especially in the areas of major items and major funding uh to to make them aware that they want all these good things but a it you know it it, it, it also takes money to support it so we'll see uh when the final report comes in or a certain next september when we get it uh to drill down a little bit about maybe answer some of those questions and figure out if it is short term long term and uh uh, the effectiveness of law, because that's basically, if it goes to the General Assembly, we're talking about them assisting us in in, uh, in, in actual legislation. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Bennett. And I'll just leave you all with one thought, which is that uh, the $730 million deficit, operating deficit that we're anticipating is about 20% of transit's operating budget. So if that gap is not filled, there are going to there are going to be issues. So that that is some that is really where our focus is, along with if we're going to work together to solve this really hard problem, what else can we bring to the table? What else can we solve? What else can we, you know, generate excitement in the region about? So it's a it's a exciting report and we're looking forward to working with all of you to refine the recommendations. And I know some of our members work closely with the service boards. Uh, I've been around it long enough over all these years. They need to sit down and rewrite it. It is the most complicated, convoluted legislation that exists in the state of Illinois, and how they support uh, us up here regionally in in in, uh, in uh, through the RTA. It's we had a presentation years ago about trying to figure out how how this funding works. It's so complicated. It's so I've just never seen a piece of legislation written like that, and it kept changing sometimes over the years too. So that that just maybe the first. Re rewrite the uh, the RTA law. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, moving on to the public comment. Um, none being, is there? Uh, any other business? Oh, I'm sorry. Any other I'm moving along here. I know. I like, I like, being, I forgot, I like, about, how, I forgot I like about how these go in person. I like, but it's back in person. That's right. Uh, the next item under executive session, we have we have a couple routes to take here. I, I've spoken to our executive director and I think through council, we don't necessarily have to go into executive session unless you want to. Both of those items can be discussed uh, openly as far as I'm concerned. One is to deal with past closed session minutes. Uh, which hello? We'd to, of which we'd have to, hello, who is this? It's Garland and Heather Armstrong oh, from sorry, Des Moines, Iowa. How you comment. doing? Garland, welcome. 
All right. I just want to ask you, um, have you, um, have you um, tried to make sure about the, um, you know, the, especially the, the bot, the, especially like, you know, where you could get the funding, especially for those, for the caps, like, you know, for the bottles and the, and the glass and the plastic, because for the vending machines, like in Illinois. So we're trying, so I'm trying to make sure, have you got it up to date on it? Because right here in Des Moines, Iowa, they got the vending machines for the plastic, the glass and the, the cans. And I thought if Illinois is still going to keep tr- going to get it up and running before I left Illinois to make sure when will you get it so you can keep up with the data and get the funding of it because I'm up to date on it because so far they discontinued it in in the in the 80s and I remember the glass bottles way back in the 70s where we got a refund for it so when will they be able to get that up and running and also too I'm concerned about the possible strike for the freight trains that might cause metra and when will no, make illegal. is it illegal to to go on strike for that and when was the last time they had a strike clause on the contract to make sure that the freight doesn't go on strike whenever whenever something like this is happening or looming at the beginning of your mini, uh, uh, meeting garland uh, aaron addressed it obviously we're all concerned uh, the impact of a strike is going to affect not only uh, passenger, but certainly freight or freight, not, not only freight, but passenger rail. We don't know that. Uh, we've attempted to be in touch with the uh, with the major uh, railroads. Uh, haven't really gotten any uh, idea yet. But yes, obviously, if it takes place, uh, we know in uh, in the state and certainly in this region that when one shuts down, it all shuts down. So uh, I'm sure the people at a higher pay grade than us the governor and general assembly mayor of city of chicago will do their best to try to help resolve that issue before it happens as far as a bottle cap thing that's also out of my pay grade i don't know if somebody here can answer well, that type of legislation garland we'll we'll look into that and get back to you on the bottle recycling so uh, we appreciate the comments okay and make sure to make sure about the make sure because ct one time they put a strike clause in their contract and i think they should do it for the for the freight and then for the metro to make sure that they put a strike clause in their contract to avert a strike. That's the hardest issue of them all. Yeah. Well, they'll be lucky yeah. to get that done. <laughs> we can do that maybe in a public sector, but a private sector is a whole different area, Garland. I understand. Thank Mayor you. Bennett. Thank all you, right. Garland. Hope all is well. All right. You too. All right. Any other? Other public comments um, from on? Thank you. Nothing else online. Public comments in the room. Okay. As I was explaining about Section 11, we can skip going to exec session. The one item is regarding past minutes, which I think is going to be recommend, recommendation release. And the other one is, is the executive director's uh, the recommendation uh, to the board uh, about a uh, salary increase uh, for, after, the and after the performance evaluation uh, for her position. So unless there's no objection, I make a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, to release the minutes? Yes. Moved and seconded. And the motion again is in your package, those minutes that are being recommended to be released. If no comments or other further questions regarding it, Aaron call roll. Mayor Bennett. Yes. Frank Beal. President Brawley. Yes. Mayor Darch. Yes. Paul Goodrich. Yes. Tim Healy. Yes. Nina Itamudia. Yes. Mayor Noak. Yes. President Reinbold, Aye. Mayor Rotering, Stephen Schaefer, yes, Carolyn Schofield, yes, and Sheehan, yes, Matt Walsh, yes, Diane Williams, yes. Motion carries. We will uh, release the closed session minutes that were reviewed by our legal counsel um, and recommended for uh, opening. Diane, and based upon the executive director's uh, performance review, which which you all participated in. Uh, there is a recommendation to approve a 3% increase for ex- executive director salary, uh, retroactive July 1st, and uh, uh, also authorizing the expenditure for professional development training. There's a motion. A second. In a second. Then this is Diane Williams. I move that we do approve that. It's been done, Diane. Thank you. Oh, I couldn't hear it. I'm sorry. That's all right. 
Aaron, call the roll. Uh, we had Milk and Darch moving. Um, okay. Mayor Bennett. Yes. Frank Beal. President Brawley. Yes. Mayor Darch. Yes. Paul Goodrich. Yes. Jim Healy. Aye. Nina Edamudia. Yes. Mayor Noak. Enthusiastic guy. Yeah. Um, President Reinwald. Mayor Rotering. Stephen Schaefer. Yes. Carolyn Schofield. Yes. Ann Sheehan. Yes. Matt Walsh. Yes. Diane Williams. Yes. The motion carries. Uh, congratulations, Aaron. So I've uh, obviously reviewed all those performances, uh, rec, uh, re, uh, comments and reports, and you've done a great job. We appreciate it, especially the last two years going through uh, what we have on remote sessions and the work still being done by this agency and your leadership and direction. Uh, and more importantly, probably even so, you went stepping outside of our your normal capacity and, and assisting with uh, the various regional groups on uh, on planning and uh, reaction to COVID as we went through uh, the economic development, the, the Chicago group, the county group. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. I'll just say I couldn't do it without your support, the board's support, and continued guidance, and also um, without such a great staff overall who helps support the work of this agency day in and day out. So thank you. Okay. Um, moving forward, the executive committee, we're going to stay here. Mm -hmm. We are going to move rooms for executive committee. Uh, you're going to have to leave us all because I don't know where the All right, we will is. find it. But first, let's go ahead and say the next meeting will be held jointly with the MPO Policy Committee on October 12th. Um, we're planning for Union Station. They've got a bigger space over there. But also, again, like I mentioned, hopefully we'll have some positive news on their mega grant application. They can share a little bit about that um, program of projects. Um, yes. We have a time set for that yet? Uh, it will be, I believe, at same time, same time 9.30, right? 9.30. They have a large re uh, meeting room? And they do have a large meeting room to meet the requirements of both uh, the board and the MPO will be in person. Okay. If something changes prior to that, we'll let you know. Uh, I guess there is a possibility if for some reason that it could end up being remote. I mean, I think, you know, pending public health information, but I think at this point we would like to plan for um, an in-person meeting yes. for that meeting. I do think, again, uh, I'll ask before we close here, too, that uh, should things continue, we should have a discussion as a board about um, the value of in-person, but balancing that with recognizing the needs of um, your professional responsibilities and getting work done and the congestion that exists and the greenhouse gases that might be saved <laughs> if we weren't in person all the time. So I think um, I think that conversation will probably be on the agenda at some point in the future. Too. Going forward, right. We'll obviously meet uh, October, November. We'll be off in December, but... Uh... Probably, maybe at our November meeting. We could have that discussion. Again, and it, it may change too. I mean, obviously we have people that are remote today. Uh, things do come up. Uh, professional uh, obligations uh, may take place. So that doesn't necessarily mean that even in November or going forward that we can't go into a, uh, into a remote. But it also, depends, it also depends on the governor continuing to allow us to do it too. So. Well, and even prior to the current, the COVID situation, we still had, occasionally people calling in as long as we had those yes. in, in the room um i think flexibility in this modern age is definitely something people have learned that there's a usefulness to that okay uh notwithstanding executive session right after this and it'll be real quick i'll entertain a motion to adjourn so, moved and seconded and unfortunately i've got to call a roll oh. <laughs> well you don't i do uh mayor bennett <laughs> frank <laughs> beal <laughs> president brawley yes mayor darch Yes. Paul Goodrich. Yes. Tim Healy. Yes. Nina Edamudia. Yes. Mayor Noak. Yes. Uh, President Reinbold. Aye. Mayor Rotering. Stephen Schaefer. Yes. Carolyn Schofield. Yes. Dean. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. I heard you. Uh, Matt Walsh. Yes. Diane Williams. Yes. Motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. And for those who would like a little tour, I'm sure staff will do that. It is a beautiful facility and glad to see it for the first time. Yes. Glad to have you all in. Thank Thanks. you.